And welcome back as we continue our discussion of what to do about meth in the state of Oklahoma. We have several guests here on the panel to kind of discuss some of the options that may be out there. Uh, and I'll just introduce them real quickly. Kim David, State Senator from Wagner. We have Tulsa County District Attorney Tim Harris. We have State Representative Mike Ritz from Broken Arrow. We have State Representative David Derby from Owasso. We have the head of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics, Daryl Weaver, and Rebecca Stovall, who's a pharmacist, who can kind of help explain a little bit about uh, the, the, the pharmacy aspect and so forth. I'm going to start with State Senator Kim David and Kim, you know, when this thing first came up to you, it was kind of one of those things that you were a little nonplussed about, I and mean, maybe not all that excited. But then something changed. Tell me a little bit about why you want to pass this bill uh, related to pharmaceuticals, uh, making pseudoephedrine a prescription-only bill. Well, what happened was when the session was over, um, I went back to uh, my district and started listening to the people that live there, mm -hmm. that put up with with this problem on a day in and day out basis, and. Once I started talking to my law enforcement officers and my firefighters, finding out um, the kind of cost that's involved, you know, our small, our small communities, um, you know, they're being devastated by the cost of, of meth manufacturing. Yeah. So it really is, it. it really is taking a toll. And, and to me, it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect from the people who have not had any involvement in meth. They kind of yes. think that, that that's just some people that are bad people and it's their issue and so forth. I don't think they realize how much it's costing the state of Oklahoma in taxpayer dollars and the drain on, uh, on the, the police departments, the sheriff's departments and so forth. And not only that, the risk that's involved. That's right. And not only is it the drain on the, the tax dollars, but with the new shake and bake meth labs and how mobile they are, you don't know. You could take your child into Walmart. You don't know that someone's not there with a meth lab in their backpack. Right. So. Yeah, it's a dangerous situation. It uh, Tulsa County District Attorney Tim Harris, you're passionate about this issue. Talk a little bit about uh, your feelings about meth. Well, Russ, uh, I'm here and I'm honored to be with all these other folks. We need to come together as a community because in my 26 years of prosecution, I haven't seen a challenge our public safety like I see with meth labs. We were a national leader when we took pseudoephedrine and put it behind the counter and we saw our meth labs absolutely just drop off. In fact, I think in 2005 we had as low as 50 labs, in 2007 we had 20. Mm -hmm. But then when the shake and bake method started, we jumped to 43 in 2008 and then this is just Tulsa Police Department, we jumped to 315 in 2009. 323 labs, and that's lab locations, geographic locations, not containers, right? I want people to understand. Police and hazmat are going out to locations. 323 in 2010, and I checked with the Tulsa Police Department yesterday at 4 o'clock. We are at 410 labs in Tulsa, and that's just the Tulsa Police Department. That's not the Sheriff's Office, that's not Broken Arrow, Jenks, Owasso, Bixby, all of those other smaller communities. We are at epidemic proportions. We've had six people die. We're in the process of an investigation of another 15-month-old that we believe might have died in a meth fire. If we had <laughs> seven people in Tulsa County die of E. coli, this would be front page news about everything, okay? Right. But it kind of happens gradually. And because it can happen anywhere in the shake and bake method, you're not immune from it whether you're in a motel or a strip shopping mall or even a private residence, you could be a victim. What does it do to your caseload for the district attorney's office? Uh, I, I did some look and just in 2010, excuse me, in 2011 up to this year, we're at 246 cases of either endeavoring or manufacturing methamphetamine. If you go back to 2008, we're close to somewhere between 800 and 1,000 felony cases. That's just endeavoring and manufacturing. That doesn't take into effect uh, possession of the precursor or any of the other accoutrements that you could have that you need to make a shake and bake meth. And so it's a great, great strain where we could be using those taxpayer dollars to prosecute other more violent criminals, get them through the system faster, give victims faster justice. But so much of our resources, Russ, are being eaten up by fighting meth no. and meth labs. And, and real quick, yes or no, how do you fall on uh, prescription only for pseudoephedrine? Should that law pass? I've looked at Oregon. I've looked at Mississippi. I think Tulsa has to have the courage to make pseudoephedrine prescription drug. Tracking with the new smurfing is beating the system and I don't see that tracking will solve our problem. If I thought there was any other way to attack this, I would be on board with that, but I don't think there is another way to do it but for making it a prescription. The next two guys say, not so fast. 
All right. State Representative Mike Ritz, let's talk a little bit about uh, the situation with meth. You would prefer that we get involved in, in a national registry. Talk a little bit about your position on, on pseudoephedrine and, and, and what you think might be a better solution for Oklahoma. Thank you, Russ. Well, we, we all identify the problem. We all agree that there is a problem. Right. There's no doubt about that. The solutions are what's complicated because we're talking about 99% uh, of the citizens that we have to look at their rights and their liberties and putting them in a prescription situation is going to take away and cost a tremendous amount to the system, the healthcare system right now that's overloaded. It's going to cost a prescription drug. They're going to have to go to the pharmacist and it's not going to be guaranteed that it's going to be tracked as a prescription drug. You look at Oregon, it's men mentioned in Oregon, 22% uh, uh, of the deaths have gone up since they enacted the prescription law there uh, to meth. So, you know, it's, it's something that's complicated. I think we have a national tracking system that we're not utilizing here that's free to the states. We need to not just block it at the pharmacy level. We need to track it with states. Primarily the, the Midwest is a big problem. And then we need to close the borders up because we know the meth is coming from Mexico. We know the, uh, the, the cartels, the drug cartels, which unfortunately even our own federal government is uh, giving guns to. But as a result, you know, we know that we have a problem coming from Mexico, which will continue to be there. So lock up the borders. Punish the bad guys, prosecute them, come back and, and use all the, uh, the instruments and the tools of, of law enforcement, which do a fabulous job. We have a lot of family members. But as a veteran, I look at it very, very cautiously of giving up liberties, giving up, uh, you know, uh, freedoms that we share for a prescription drug for 99% of the people that get for allergies and colds very cheaply. Now they're going to have to go to the doctor. They're going to have to pay a, a $70 or whatever doctor's fee right. and a prescription service inconveniencing a lot of people when we can go on with this national registry and expand it. Uh, we're going to lose a million dollars of tax dollars for over-the-counter drugs. So there's, there's a lot of things we need to talk about. Well, and, and quickly, you, you are a doctor. You have a medical practice as well. Talk a little bit about specifically that inconvenience because we're hearing a lot about that from some of the folks who've been uh, going on Facebook and Twitter and so forth. They don't want to pay the $35 copay to get a, uh, an allergy pill. Uh, do you think there would be significant backlash if a bill like uh, Senator David's passes? Well, I, I know in my own practice, which is South Brook and Arrow, Tulsa County, Bigsby area, uh, my patients are very upset about it because you know they don't want to have to go to a simple allergy solution with pseudoephedrine, which is in a lot of products. Uh, products, you know, Allegra D just went, Allegra D just went over the counter. Claritin D, Zyrtec, Mucinex, all of these products have pseudoephedrine in them, and. Are we really looking at it? And if we're, you know, if you just place the, the names here of your series of alcohol instead of meth, mm -hmm. we got a tremendous alcohol problem. Are we going to put alcohol under a prescription? I don't know. Nope. Let's go to David Derby, and, uh, state, our state representative from uh, Owasso. You have an interesting take on this because you're studying to be a pharmacist. Uh, and, and so what's your take on, on the situation with, with meth and pseudoephedrine? Well, one, first of all, I want to say that thank you for having me here. I've served underneath uh, D.A. Harris as a, uh, an expert witness when I worked for the Tulsa Police Department. And I used to work for the Missouri State Highway Patrol, so I've been in both sides of the situation of being a, uh, someone who is an expert witness and also trying to balance this uh, legislation in regards to we have to be able to govern and govern well. Uh, you know, you brought up o Oregon. It, you know, Oregon isn't unique in the sense of what, it, what it's done. You know, n California decreased 93% without having a uh, prescription only. Washington, 97%. Arizona, 97%. Utah, 99%. Idaho was down 94% in the same year that Oregon went to prescription. If you want to look at Mississippi, who is prescription, and uh, Alabama, who is Implex, is which what we're trying to uh, ascertain or mm -hmm. implement here. September 2010 to 2011 for Mississippi had a decrease of 60 percent. Alabama had a decrease in 74 percent uh, in their methamphetamine uh, uh, seizures and, and manufacturing. If you want to look at the expenditures on the state, this, there's a recent study that will come out next week that I got the numbers from already. It is going to be a burden to our state Medicaid and Medicare by 4.9 uh, 4, 4, 4. 9 million. Uh, it's going to increase our private insurance out of pocket by 85.5 million. It's going to increase our personal out of pocket by 17.6 million. Mm -hmm. And I know that everybody's saying, well, 
you know, you're having problems getting into the physicians now. We have 59 counties out of the 77 that are below the national one pr uh, primary care physician for 3,500 uh, citizens. And, you're, and with a Rx only, you're going to increase the amount of visits to 300,000. This is all coming out of this report next week. Uh, not to mention the fact that we have the loss of revenue because we're going from a taxable to a non-taxable. And, you know, if you want to use the DEA as a, as a source, which most of us here would like to do that, they came out in 2005, and again in 2011, or 10, if you want to look at the meth, Combat Meth Act, it says that regardless of what form of Sudafed we have, whether it's tablets, liquid, or gel caps, methamphetamine can be produced from any of the form. All right, let's move on and talk with the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics Director Daryl Weaver. Thanks for being with us. Talk a little bit about where we're seeing methamphetamine in Oklahoma because it sure seems like in eastern and northeastern Oklahoma it's a bigger problem than in the western part of the state. Well, uh, methamphetamine is no respecter of persons. Uh, in my quarter of a century of drug enforcement for our state, uh, there's not been any drug that's been more insidious and caused more uh, problems and collateral damage in a negative sense than methamphetamine. Obviously, in northeast Oklahoma, uh, we have a huge uh, problem with methamphetamine labs, but we are seeing these labs uh, popping up in western Oklahoma and south central mm -hmm. Oklahoma. I think it's important that this is uh, really it comes down to uh, the intrusion of government and where are we at the point in, in the state of Oklahoma to where we have enough damage with methamphetamine labs to really look at it hard. I don't think that anyone, and we look at prescription drugs, and daily I'm confronted with what we do and how we, this pendulum and the intrusion of government and people need to have these, good, these products. But I think the collateral negative effect of methamphetamine is just overwhelming to our state. And uh, it has done more damage than anything that we've seen. And one thing that's important, that Oklahoma, and you have to remember, this is uh, great friends on this panel. I, I know Representative Derby's carrying two of our bills this year. Rep Representative Ritz is a great, great friend. We may disagree tonight mm -hmm. on this, uh, but the bottom line is we, we've tracked pseudoephedrine. Uh, we have a model program in Oklahoma, and it just simply has not been successful, even based on our operation we did within the last few weeks right here in Tulsa County. Uh, and, and a lot of people in law enforcement say it's so much more dangerous when you're trying to bust people who are on meth just because of what the drug does. These people have been up for several days. They can become very agitated. It's a much different drug. Talk about the danger of trying to bust these people and, and arrest them. Well, it's amazing. Back uh, many years ago, whenever I was undercover, when I wore a younger man's clothing, uh, and I had some hair at the time, and at that time, I remember thinking even uh, 25 years ago that I would a lot rather deal with any type of drug offender than a meth dealer or a meth user. Yeah. Uh, everything, I can tell stories all night about walking in the out, outside of a mobile home or whatever out in the country and start just shooting, arbitrarily shooting. Uh, we have our last fatal uh, shootings, our last two fatal shootings at the Bureau of Narcotics have been associated with methamphetamine dealers. It's a crazy insidious drug. Mm -hmm. But the collateral damage of, of the drug is far reaching beyond the negative sense, far beyond just that lab or just that one individual. Uh, the addiction and the meth manufacturing, if it continues and goes unchecked, it will have an effect on someone's life. It'll be a child, it'll be someone that an innocent life will right. have an effect. And, and you do come down in favor of making pseudoephedrine prescription only. You think that that might help make yes. a difference? I, I'm in favor for a Schedule Three. I think it's very important because based on our rules in Oklahoma and the Bureau of Narcotics, we have those rules. We control those rules with, with the legislature's approval. It's very important that it's a Schedule Three and not a Schedule 2. A Schedule 3, you go to the doctor one time, you can have five refills, and after that, if you have a, uh, you have a relationship with your physician, you can, they can call that in. So in reality, yeah. it's not a $35 copay every time. So I think it's important. Yeah. There, is, there is going to be, uh, have to go to a doctor, but I, I'm not sure. I would never be in a favor of the Schedule 2, which you would have to go every month to a physician. Gotcha. It's totally different. Okay, Rebecca Stovall, who's a pharmacist, thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. I, I just want to say thank you, Russ, for bringing this issue to the forefront. I think education is, is really the key here, no matter what, what side of the fence that you're on. We need to educate. You know, there's a lot of people who, who just say, you know, if, if the drug companies could, could manufacture a tamper-proof form of pseudoephedrine, we could be done with this whole thing. Is that possible? What, what do you hear? I, I don't think it's possible. I think they will find some, some way, whether it's gel cap, tablet, liquid, um, they're probably better chemists at finding ways around 
being able to extract what they need yeah. to make the methamphetamine. You were telling me earlier that, that um, when it comes to a bill that would make it a, a law that you'd have to have a prescription for pseudoephedrine, that, that that maybe is a starting point, but that's only part of the equation. There, there are other things that they should do. What, what all do you think that Oklahoma should do? Well, absolutely, I agree. It should not be a Schedule II. Um, but with the Schedule Three, you can limit your refills, and then you can also limit maybe the quantity that you get per month. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, you know, with the nine grams per 30 days right now, you can get 300 tablets of the 30 milligram pseudoephedrine. And so when they're using multiple IDs, which they do, they're mm -hmm. getting those uh, pseudoephedrine tablets that yeah. they need. And the other thing about prescription, currently with the nine grams per 30 days, you can only get 25 of the Claritin D. So a lot of patients are forced to go get that prescription anyway because if they take it daily, they're not getting their 30 days worth. They're only getting 25. Interesting stuff. All right, um, just a, a couple topics, and 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 we're getting some really good comments. Uh, people coming in, and there's one thing. Questions is there's so many people in Oklahoma that do not have health insurance, uh, and, and if they have to go to the doctor for for an allergy pill, that could be somewhat burdensome. Um, Representative Ritz, let's start with you on that. I mean, is that a valid argument for not voting for the bill? Well, I think if we look. At the trends when the allergy season, you know, we're, we're in the probably top 1% of allergies in the whole nation. If you look at the trends of allergy sufferers in Oklahoma, pseudoephedrine is an excellent substitute or, or a cure, a treatment for the allergy symptoms, colds, flus, things like that. Uh, you're going to deluge the system, Russ. It, it's just going to overload the system with people having to go. There's no doctor that's going to put their neck on the line to give 300 Sudafed tablets on a prescription uh, and refill it without seeing the patient. Uh, you know, that way you're just ripe for abuse. So I think with the NPLEX system, the registry that the pharmaceutical industry that is free of charge to the state can track it. It's lifetime tracking. If someone goes to a pharmacy tries to get it, I also, uh, representing Derby, has a bill already in place uh, for some good solutions. But I also told him about the uh, global positioning satellites that they're using mm -hmm. for a lot of things with uh, uh, victim crimes and uh, real-time tracking. So if uh, a, a person is convicted of uh, felony uh, methamphetamine use, shake and bake, whatever, they get near the pharmacy, the pharmacist gets a call just within seconds, they're, they're alerted, law enforcement, whatever. Uh, Representative Derby, we had uh, one uh, person who posted on Facebook the Implex system. Uh, I guess Kentucky is involved with that, but they've actually had their uh, meth labs increase. Uh, are you familiar with anything going on in Kentucky that was from the public? Is no, I'm not aware of anything as of yeah. right now from, from Kentucky. I will say, and, and thank you for the nice segue, is that, you know, the number one question I get is what percent of the Sudafed that is sold mm -hmm. actually is diverted into the methamphetamine? Well, there's not any real good, t good data that we have for Oklahoma, but the University of Kentucky did a study, and they found that 2% of what is sold over the counter is actually being diverted. Uh, District Attorney Tim Harris, uh, we, last year we didn't take any action. We had all these smaller towns and communities like Wagner and Old Mulgee and so forth that tried to pass their own uh, rules and, and, and ordinances and so forth. Uh, the, the district or the, uh, the uh, attorney general for the state said no, that, that, that oversteps state law and so forth. Um, how big of a problem is it when you have all these small towns who are screaming saying that this is completely overburdening us, the state has to do something, and then you have people who seem like they're not all that interested in trying to solve the problem? That's why we're all here tonight. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping we got out of committee last uh, session in a 13 to 4 vote, but it never got a, a full hearing on the House floor. That's all I want. I want a, a free and fair debate in the state of Oklahoma so that all of these issues can come out and then citizens can contact their representatives and say, listen, this is my opinion. You represent me. This is how I want you to vote on the subject. I think tracking is good, but this whole smurfing beats any kind of tracking. They aren't going above their nine gram limit. They're getting together with all their friends and they're buying up to that nine grams a month and collectively and collaboratively they're getting that either to an intermediary or to the cook and for that they're either getting methamphetamine or cash back. When we did CastNet about a month ago, I happened to go out with OBN agents at a Walgreens here watching four guys pull up in a van and one at a time they would go out and buy their methamphetamine. We tailed them, we made a stop, 
found out that the lady who was driving in, in one of the cars that we followed had gone down to the homeless shelter, picked up a homeless man, had him buy pseudoephedrine, and paid him $30 cash for it. They are beating the tracking system. That's why NPLEX isn't going to be the solution, in my opinion. Uh, Director, we, we had a, a question come in uh, on Twitter. It talks about if we do put a stop to meth with the prescription uh, for pseudoephedrine, will they just move on to something else, and is that a concern? Well, uh, I, I always uh, kind of preach at the Capitol and talk uh, amongst uh, civic groups that uh, any type of drug crime is an in-progress crime. And that's very critical. It's not an after-the-fact crime. And because it's an in-progress crime, it's forever changing. Uh, we do not, if we were st still deploying the same methods we were 25 years ago, we would have no success. Because it's an in-progress crime, we have to have the courage to set those policies to ever change with the times. And I think that's one example that we're, we're faced with. Nothing's going to solve, because it's an in-progress crime, nothing's going to solve and be the, the solve to all the right. drug crimes. Uh, they're go they're going to, we still got the drug cartels in Oklahoma. Yeah. We still have these type of issues. But I've always said of the drug cartels, at least they're removed from us. They have to have a transportation and, and some type of network to get their drug to Oklahoma, which we can infiltrate. When you have these shake and bake labs, obviously, the collateral negative effect through fires and these type of things are really the huge issue. It's not the production and the quantity of methamphetamine, it's the collateral damage of that methamphetamine production. Yeah, and, and if, if we are able to limit significantly the meth labs, there's still the problem of meth coming in from Mexico. Uh, absolutely. We're not going to solve that with any type of pseudoephedrine bill, no. uh, but I do believe that we can. Uh, you have to remember that Mexico methamphetamine is made by the old method, the P2P method, right. and because of that, Pseudoephedrine dope that we are making, methamphetamine we are making in Oklahoma is stronger than the, the drug coming in from Mexico. And I would say and, and, and make a point that possibly that's why many of the addicts can get off of that type of drugs. In, in Oregon alone, they saw a 32 percent reduction in meth requests for mental health and substance abuse. So little things like that, this collateral positive effect, in my opinion, uh, would have a positive effect for Oklahoma, even the crime rate at a 50-year low. Uh, anybody in Oklahoma would love to see our crime rate at a 50-year low. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Ripps, um, uh, kind of a tougher question here about the, the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. You know, several years ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about how they were buying influence with doctors, with all the perks and so forth, and now there's very specific rules about what drug companies can do in interactions they have with doctors. When this bill came up last year and after the session was over, one of your fellow lawmakers came out and said it was the pharmaceutical industry that killed this bill. Uh, I guess my, my question is, people in Oklahoma may be a little leery of having big pharmaceutical companies with their money and influence and power coming in dictating what our laws may be. Does that concern you that, that the, the big pharmaceuticals are, are, seem to be playing a role in this? Well, I, I don't know. I haven't been approached by any pharmaceutical companies about this. I'm just using personal experience, and then I value personal freedom and liberty so much that I want to make sure that we move very cautiously before we and use all the tools before we jump into anything like a prescription. Uh, we're going to call, we're going to diligence. I'll say it again: diligence the system. And you mentioned a while ago that there's people here that don't want solutions. We want solutions, but we want proper solutions. We want to make sure that people's. This is a free society. You're not going to stamp out everything. You, you can't put a, a camera in everybody's home or bedroom or whatever. So I would say go after securing the borders. The Sinaloa cartel, which is where that fills the vacuum that's providing a lot of meth. And I'll mention again, in Oregon, after they enacted the law in 05, 22% meth, meth deaths have gone up because the Mexican cartel has deluged Oregon. You'll see it all over. They'll fill the vacuum. They're, they're the ones that are fueling the fire. It's not, right. you know, if the pharmaceutical industry is trying to, to uh, enter into the dialogue honestly by providing a system to help the, the solution, albeit. Yeah. And, and I don't want to Im imply that you guys do not want to uh, solve the problem uh, by any means. So don't let me uh, make that in in inference. Uh, Senator David, what kind of, um, of, of response have you gotten? I know you've put on the, the event at the Capitol a couple mm -hmm. days. Uh, what was the, the outcome of that? What, what were people saying? Well, the, the response I've gotten from everyone is that you know, we, had a, we heard a lot of talk tonight about personal freedoms and inconvenience and the costs associated with if we pass this for someone having to get a, a prescription. There is not a reasonable person out there that once they find out the facts and, and we educate them on this subject, you know, we're talking about a drug that's for congestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is not a life-saving drug. This is not something you absolutely have to have if you have a cold. There are other cold medicines out there in Oregon. 
a lot of people just went to a different method. They went to a different drug that they could get without a prescription if they couldn't get one. We're talking about um, saving our drug-endangered children. You know, their lives are at risk here. We have our firefighters and our police officers that put their lives on the line every day when they go out and fight these, the fires or they go in and, and make these arrests at these meth labs. Um, I just think that the cost and the expense and the, the lives of our children are more important than an inconvenience. Well, uh, District Attorney Tim Harris, real quickly, um, uh, a little talk about the, uh, some people say, okay, if, if we make it a prescription only uh, drug, we're still having problems with people breaking into pharmacies and stealing Oxycontin and those kinds of things. Would that not exacerbate that problem? I don't think it would. And as I listen to my learned colleagues here, I want to get rid of meth labs. Okay, I don't think that making pseudoephedrine prescription is going to solve our methamphetamine addiction problem globally or even in the state of Oklahoma. But I am looking at labs, getting rid of labs. That is what's costing us millions of dollars of taxpayers' dollars. Whether you're paying me now or paying me later, it's like the old Midas muffler ad. You're paying, and people are paying. And I'm trying to figure out how to recapture those resources, okay, so that we can use those for public safety in other ways. If we can get rid of these labs and we can get rid of the fires and we can get rid of these uh, children that are going into the Department of Human Services because they're being uh, exposed to all the toxicity, all these labs that are laying alongside the roads and, and, and the firefighters and, and law enforcement agents that are, that are asking for changes of assignment because they're having health issues, even after they're wearing Tyvek suits and respirators in this, I want to shut down the labs and then little bit by little bit we can knock away at the methamphetamine addiction. But right now it's the cost of the labs that's eaten us alive. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca Stoll, let's go back to you. Uh, similar kind of question, does it, does it worry you in any way, shape or form or should it uh, concern pharmacists if this is another uh, medicine that becomes prescription only uh, that may have a criminal element trying to break in and, and maybe putting your life in danger? Well, from a pharmacist perspective, I mean, it's behind the counter now. So it is in our pharmacies, and you could still be held up or have a, a, someone come in and try to rob your pharmacy for that. Um, so I think the risk is there whether you go prescription or not prescription because it is in your pharmacy. Uh, Director Weaver, uh, crime as, in general in some of these states has gone down. You talk about people who are stealing all the copper and those kinds of things because they're doing it so they can buy the ingredients uh, to make meth. Do you think there will be an overall drop in, in overall crime if we're able to pass a bill like this? Uh, you know, Russ, it's amazing. A, a couple of years back, I was not for this uh, at all. I, I actually thought that it was too much of an intrusion. Me, I personally thought it. There's a thousand items in your, can, your stores that you can get high off of. We can't control everything in the state of Oklahoma. I couldn't agree with Dr. Ritz more on that. So we have to be very cautious about this intrusion of government. But after I saw the Oregon numbers and after I saw uh, so many policymakers ask me at the Capitol, what can we do in a positive sense? And this has such a collateral positive effect for our state. Uh, that, that's when I got on board with it. I think that the whole crime situation, it, it could be absolutely something that is remarkable. Historically, it could be one of the greatest things our state's ever done. And uh, we have to continue to fight this and with a, with a great courage. Let me ask you this, uh, because there are, it seems like that some towns and cities have some uh, uh, leeway where they can pass their own ordinances. Now, in, in the, 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 count, the, the counties and the towns that tried to pass these rules uh, to make it prescription only, uh, the states uh, said, okay, that's overstepping your state bounds. Can they do that? Could, could we create a law that would give counties and towns the ability to do that on their own so us in the eastern part of the state that are dealing with a more significant problem uh, be able to, to pass those rules so that the people in the western part of the state don't have to deal with it? For that. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants that one? I don't know. Hey, Title 63 governs, and that's why the Attorney General, uh, Scott Pruitt, came out and said, hey, uh, you, you can't usurp the state power in regulating this drug, okay? I don't think county to county, because what you've seen, at least in Missouri, they are able to do that county to county, and what they have done is they've just moved their problem from a county where it is prescription to a county to where it's not. So it kind of moves and free flows where they can get the pseudoephedrine. I want us to have a statewide approach. We were a national leader when we put it behind the counter. The federal government looked at us and said, Oklahoma is a leader. I want us to be a leader again. Oh, only about one minute left. Um, the, you, the bill that you're trying to pass last year failed. Yours is pretty similar to that. Do you think it'll pass this year? I think so. No. Do you think it has a shot of passing this year? 
I'm trying to get out there with education because people are paying for this one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I don't want another kid to burn up in another meth lab. I don't want another child having to go into the Department of Human Services and be taken out of their family with who knows what kind of health uh, problems they're going to have for the rest of their lives by being ex exposed to this. And I think the people of Oklahoma are willing to put up with an inconvenience, although like Dr. Ritz, I support personal liberties and I support personal freedoms. This is an inconvenience. I think the rest of the people of Oklahoma will be willing to withstand to get our hands around this problem. You guys, both of you two, are, are, are against it. Uh, do you think that we'll do something this year? I, I know for a fact that we're going to do something. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got my bill laid out here. If we implement MPLEX, we're going to be a part of a 17-state coalition that's going to stop point of sale, real-time data. Uh, we, we're going to have a Class A felony, if it involves a child eight years and younger, it's going to be a Class B felony if it's eight years and older. That's something that only two, st two states have that now. We don't have enhancements to our drug courts, which is something that I'm going to run with, with on a separate bill with mental health and substance abuse to implement drug court throughout our entire state. There are only three states that require a new uh, a, a, a containing system with uh, meth labs. There is no state that has a wait period, which will be the uh, uh, in, in my bill. Uh, there's no, no one that has any type of fake ID language in them, MPLEX. The state of uh, Illinois has an education awareness. That, you know, it's a big blue sign they have on the on the on the mat that says that if you're smurfing, you, it's a felony. Oh, by the way. Um, you know, again, we're going to lower our limits from 9 to 7.2. Uh, again, these are all the bullet points, and I got, I got 10 or 11 here that you can have uh, that no state in the union has. And so that's what I'm saying. If you want to look at MPLEX, and you can look at Alabama, Mississippi, RX, and MPLEX, you're going to say that 74% de de decrease in meth labs in Alabama, only a 60% in uh, Mississippi with an RX, and then you couple it with this type of bill that says we're going to stomp, stomp the snot out of you if you want to do this again, and that's my usual vo vocabulary. Uh, sorry. <laughs> this is how we are going to approach it here in the state of Oklahoma and not inconvenience 95% of the pe people out there that use this drug legally. Director Weaver will probably be the last word on, on this. If we don't do something this year, what do you think happens for the state of Oklahoma with that? Well, I think we continue to fight the fight. I think we uh, continue to look at our register and try to pick those people off. I think we continue uh, to track the best that we can and stop the, these conspirators. Uh, we're not going to give up. Uh, no matter what the tools we have, we're going to fight. Uh, I'm, I'm going to fight as a director and a chief drug enforcement officer for our state. Uh, I respect the legislature. They're all my friends. Uh, but we're going to take the tools given to us. I'm going to have an opinion what I think. And we're going to fight. We're going to continue to fight and try to make a difference in Oklahoma. Uh, and, and I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that we can find solutions. I'm encouraged tonight that we can come together in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and talk realistically. Everybody up here, and I know the heart of each one of these individuals, we want good for Oklahoma. And that's what we're fighting for. And we want the right solution, uh, and hopefully we'll find that. Well, I can tell that all of you are very passionate about the issue, and I thank all of you for coming out. Uh, and we hope that this is just going to be the beginning of the conversation as it moves through the state legislature in the spring of next year. We're going to be following the situation, and we hope that you as viewers will get involved in the process and offer up suggestions as well. Again, this is, uh, it's been an enlightening hour, and thank all of you for being with us, and thank you, the viewer, for tuning in tonight. Good night. Thanks, Russ. Thank Appreciate it.